Hi, everyone. Um, I guess the room is full, so we can start. Um, and that way, this will all be over sooner. And, <laughs> and or we can ask more questions, if, if you have questions. So um, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is, my name is Ken Wong, and um, I am the founder and creative director of um, a new studio based here in Melbourne called Mountains. Um, you may know me as uh, the lead designer of a game called Monument Valley. Um, I'm also the creator of um, an independent game called Hacky Cat, which is like hacky sack, but with cats. <laughs> um, I was the art director of a game called Alice Manish Returns. Um, and I have over 12 years uh, experience in games, depending on how you count it. Um, I'm really pleased to be, be, to be here today to talk to you um, about what makes a giant. So um, this quote is usually attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. Um, if I have seen further, it is because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Um, he's actually uh, quoting um, a notion, um, I'm going to try and say, Bernard de Chat. Um, which uh, John of Salisbury documented, he said, Bernie used to compare us to dwarves perched on the shoulders of giants. He pointed out that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have keener vision or greater height, but because we are lifted up and borne aloft on their gigantic stature. Um, so before I go further, um, well, hang on, actually going back, I just missed something. <laughs> um, so I think that this notion of, of standing on the shoulders of giants is incredibly relevant for us working in games. Um, we build upon the, the technology that comes before, but uh, all the games that have come in the past four decades, games that we've played, games that we discuss, um, uh, we, we, we build on these ideas, and so in a way, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and our industry is moving so fast, right? Every year, every decade, there's new technology, new thoughts, new distribution methods, new ways of monetizing, uh, new ways of expressing. Um, so it is, it's great that we're, we have the opportunity to talk about this. Um, and before I go further, I, I want to put this into context of two things that I believe to be true. Um, one is that games is a creative medium and uh, that we can learn things from other creative mediums. So uh, whether it's photography or dance or poetry or um, song or film, um, I feel like games is, is one of these many forms of expression and the boundaries between them are actually pretty blurry. Um, you know, it is really not... Uh, uncommon for us to be working in more than one medium at once. I feel like there's so much that we can learn. Uh, when we're making games, we can be learning from other mediums. Um, so I'm going to be talking not just about uh, standing on the shoulders of giants in the context of games, but how we can learn from the giants of under, other industries, other art forms, um, and how we can use that to augment our work. The second thing that I believe to be true is that we are the sum of all of our experiences, whether that's good experiences, bad experiences, things that we think are important at the time, things that seem trivial. Um, I, I feel like uh, the person that I am here today is because of everything that has come before me. Um, so uh, I hope you bear with me because uh, you know we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of stuff that's happened to me, but it, I, I feel like it's, it's all informed um, what brought me here today. Um, so to paraphrase Newton, uh, who is paraphrasing Bernie, uh, if I have done good creative work, it is because I learned from amazing creators. Um, I feel like I'm pretty good at giant climbing. Um, I've always loved stories of, of creativity and, and, and creation. In fact, I might even love that study more than creativity itself. I, I love watching uh, like making of features on, on DVDs. I love reading interviews with, with creators. I, I watch you know, movies over and over again. I, I try to, to, to study things and figure out how they're made. Um, so um, when the, the theme came up of, of what makes a giant, I really uh, jumped at the chance to 
to kind of bring um, what I had learned to the table and, and my, my passion for understanding and, and learning from um, the creators that have come before me. Uh, but when I proposed um, this, this talk title initially, What Makes a Giant, uh, I had it in mind to, to figure out uh, what, uh, why some studios kind of found greater success or became huge and, and famous more than others. You know, I was thinking of like Hideo Kojima and Nintendo and Naughty Dog and, and Bethesda and like, wow, what, 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 what was special about them? What, what secrets lie in their formula or in their, in their thoughts or their process that makes them into giants? Um, and then I realized I didn't actually care about that because if I was really that interested in these backstories and in researching this, then I probably would have done so already. And, uh, and I found that my talks go much better when I'm just talking about my personal experience and, and talking about things that I actually know about. Um, and my personal experience has not been one of really thorough research or data-driven comparisons. Um, it's been more um, subjective and more impressionistic where I'll pick up stories and I'll pick up little bits of wisdom wherever I can, whether it's in a special feature or something I read in a magazine or something I read in a, in a Gama Sutra article. And uh, that's what I want to base um, my talk on is just kind of things that I've learned along the way from various creative giants. Um, so this talk is going to be an account of my own giants, and that might sound a bit self-indulgent, and it probably is, uh, but uh, the thing that I think might be valuable from, for you is that my giants are almost certainly different from your giants, right? The, the, the things that I learned, the people that I learned those from are going to be different, and hopefully through a bit of my own self-analysis, there's going to be something there for, uh, for you that's going to be a benefit to you. Um, so my sort of way into the games industry was as an artist. Um, I've always uh, drawn, I've always um, scribbled and like I was told as a kid like oh you're good at drawing. Personally I think that all kids are good at drawing and it's just that some people stop drawing when they become self-conscious about it and some of us just keep going. Um, but um, the, the thing that really got me wanting to improve my art was probably Street Fighter, um, which is uh, a great game. It's a, it's a game that I love and I, I play and I play all of them, like all 20, 30 different Street Fighters. Um, uh, and I used to even run a Street Fighter website, uh, fan site on GeoCities, uh, which was really an excuse for me to just collect all the Street Fighter art that I could find online and categorize it and kind of chart the evolution of these characters. Um, and I, I think what I, what I loved about Street Fighter, apart from the fact that it was fun to play, was it had these bold, colorful characters, these kind of archetypal, larger than life um, world warriors who, you know, there was such, there was so much storytelling in their visual design. There's, there's these iconic silhouettes and color palettes. Um, you know, over time, many people have done these like minimalist interpretations uh, where you can just recognize them from a lineup of, of pixels or simple shapes. And um, I love that. I, I love that, you know, this was not, you know, a novel. This is not a film. This is very simplistic storytelling, but done through visual language. Um, and so, I, you know, these, these character designs really resonated with me and I've, and I've you know, I've always had this passion for character design since then. Um, Street Fighter also made me learn anatomy. Like when I was, when I needed to learn how to, to, to draw these, these characters, I needed to um, improve how I, my understanding of the human body, figure out like muscle groups, um, have a better sense of proportion. Um, so in a way, Street Fighter was, uh, you know, the video game art is, is one of the things that really pushed me onto my creative journey. Um, and uh, 
years later, I would, I would try and, and draw all of the street fighters. It's a little bit out of date now. Um, as you can see, I still have problems with anatomy and proportion. Um, but um, I've, always, I've always loved doing fan art. Fan art kind of got me started on this, on this road. And um, I still really enjoy um, celebrating the games that I love through, through fan art. Um, so I encountered Street Fighter probably around the age of eight or 10 or something. Um, moving on a little bit further, um, when I was in high school, I discovered uh, Masamune Shirao. And, um, and I bought this manga, Ghost in the Shell, and I fell in love with um, you know, the sensibility that he brought uh, that I'd never seen before in, in comics or in, or in any other media that I'd encountered. Um, obviously, he loves his sexy ladies, um, but he also has this amazing sense for robotics and technology and cybernetics. And, you know, he, he couples that with um, political ideas and, and, and how those things bear on society. And I love that he, he painted this world that, was, that felt far richer and more detailed and more fantastical than anything else I'd seen. Um, so, you know, like many teenagers, there was a time that I was really into anime and manga. And, uh, and so, you know, in my teenage years, I, I was learning a lot um, from him. Um, later, I discovered Gustav Klimt, um, who at first I found his art to be kind of repulsive. I was like, why is he drawing humans wrong? <laughs> like, like he, there's this kind of like naked, semi-grotesque forms. Everybody feels kind of like a little bit distended, a little bit willowy. Um, he also kind of doesn't care all the time about anatomy. And, and, but I, I gradually fell in love with it. And, and one of the things I learned from Gustav Klimt is that some of the things that we find ugly at first turned out to be the most compelling, the most interesting. Um, uh, I also learned from him you know, like this interesting sense of graphic, uh, graphic form, like replacing reality with with uh, abstract interpretations. You know, being able to um, to express ideas or emotions uh, through shapes and and color combinations. Um, and his sense of composition is something that's that's very much stuck with me. Um, he was known for using square frames. Um, he was known for um, using these lines of composition to cut up. Uh, the canvas into into shapes. Um, so I think I was into Gustav Klimt sort of towards the end of high school, and just after high school, I joined um, a digital art forum. Um, uh, Sijin was the first that I joined. Sijin is actually still up, amazingly. Like I took the screenshot last night, and it still looks the same as it did, like fifteen years ago. I, my account is actually still active. I managed to log in. Um, so if you go here, you can actually see my posts from, from you know, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, art, digital art forms are not something that's, that's really a thing anymore. Like people have moved on to Tumblr and Twitter and Blogspot and, other, and, and DeviantArt and other communities. Um, but at the time, this was where um, digital artists congregated and the community was small enough that everybody knew each other. Even when there were, you know, uh, three or four big forums, um, people kind of knew each other by names and by rivalries. And it was here that I, I learned um, a tremendous amount because I was exposed to so many more artists than I, than I would have in, in my normal daily life. Um, it, you know, maybe instead of, um, going to the library and, and borrowing books about the old masters, I uh, was exposed to more contemporary artists, people like Craig Mullins, who is still, um, I think, one of the, the, be the greatest digital painters of all time. Um, um, and, uh, you know, he, he worked as a mass painter and, uh, and as a concept artist, he's worked on films and, and, and comics and, and games. And uh, I find incredible that like a master like this was posting on the same forum as me and giving feedback. Um, um, it felt so egalitarian. Um, and, and, you know, here I was like on the same place as these accomplished giants. Um, giving feedback, receiving feedback, learning. 
Um, later on, um, I became a moderator and then an admin of a forum called EatPoo. And uh, that's where I met, you know, a lot of friends that have become lifelong friends. And um, a lot of those people that, that I met in those years have become incredibly successful and, and have really re refined their craft and are incredible artists. Um, people like Matt Rhodes, who is a lead concept artist at Bioware and worked on uh, Mass Effect and Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, people like Justin Cherry, who uh, uh, eventually was art director at Neverwinter uh, at Obsidian, worked on Neverwinter Nights, Dungeon Siege, now works at Turtle Rock um, on Evolve. Uh, my friend Joy Ang, um, who uh, is a tremendous artist and illustrator, now is a character designer for Adventure Time. Um, my friend Victoria Ying, um, who I met when she was like 16 years old and was also doing like anime fan art, um, has now worked on uh, Frozen and Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph and uh, many children's books. Um, Adi Granov, who um, had this amazing, you know, style of his own and um, eventually got to work on Iron Man comics right at about the time that um, it got turned into a movie. So he's got to work on the Iron Man and Avenger movies. Um, this is not someone who was on Eat Poo. This is George Lucas. Um, <laughs> changing pace a bit, um, I, I feel like uh, um, as interested as I am in art and, and illustration, I've also, I, I'm probably actually more passionate and more and better at art direction. And my first encounter with art direction was probably um, in this, this series of interviews that, that Leonard Moulton did with George Lucas um, on the Star Wars VHS set. So at around the age of 13, I, I bought the widescreen uh, versions of the original non-specialized VHS Star Wars trilogy. And when I bought it, I was like, oh, what are these interviews? This is boring. I, would, I think I'd fast forward through them at first. And then when I was too lazy to fast forward, I actually listened to them. And um, George talked about how um, the, he would do visual storytelling and how the good characters in Star Wars are all like earthy tones and, and natural materials. And that's in contrast with uh, the Empire, who's all like, plastic and metal and grays and chromes and, 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 and blacks. Um, and, and the same with the environments, you know, you've got the, the sandy natural tones of Tatooine, you've got the, these pinks and blues in Cloud City, you've got the, the, the Death Star, which is all like monochrome and, and desaturated. Um, and it's not a new idea, but it's, this was kind of the first time that I encountered the idea of art direction and the and probably the idea of visual storytelling, um, and uh, that really stuck with me. It really it really changed my my ideas about um, creativity and storytelling. Um, at the at the end of high school, I I was in my design class. I was reading this book, and I can't remember what book it is, but one of the pages in it is this excerpt from the style guide for Disney's Hercules. And it describes how um, the, the whole movie shares uh, a, a visual language, which is inspired by Greek culture. Um, you've got these, these swooping shapes and these, these swirls um, that, um, that are echoed um, everywhere from costumes to characters to architecture to the clouds to to uh, splash effects, and uh, I thought, wow, this is incredible. I, I never thought that you could like, especially Disney, that that they could, um, that they could, you know, uh, be so bold in their in in their concept of reality, portraying reality through through this style stylization. Um, of course, at the time, I was really unaware of um, Sleeping Beauty, which had gone even further than this. Um, but I, I loved this page so much that I scanned it, and I had to go back into my old files to, to, to find this. 
And so all of this knowledge, all of these visual inspirations and, and learning how to learn from other artists and learning how to learning what a style guide was, all kind of culminated in um, the work that I got to do on Alice Manage Returns. Um, so on this project, you know, I ripped off everyone from the Brothers Quay who did uh, stop motion films to uh, the illustrator Mark Ryden. Um, to um, Polish painter Beksinski. Um, and all of these references are all gathered and talked about in the art of Alice Manch Returns. Um, you know, for me, it was such a joy to, to have this artifact of this, of this time. The, the, the game is like, okay, it's all right. But the, the book I'm incredibly proud of because I learned so much from art books like this, from um, the art of, of Pixar movies, from the art of Star Wars. Um, so as much as I learned from artists, um, I, I feel like I, I never read so very much into how these artists lived or, or thought. Um, I didn't feel like it was necessary. I didn't, I was not interested in artist biographies. I felt like it was more interesting to look at the end result, to look at their work and try to figure out you know, why did, how do they see the world? Like, why do they choose these colors? Why do, how do they represent forms and contrast and composition? What, what thought processes led to that way? For me, that was part of the fun uh, of, and it would help train my eye by, by, by looking at their art and, and kind of reverse engineering it. Um, so, um, and I, switching gears a little bit, um, do, you remember, do you remember being 16? I, when I was 16, I, kind of didn't know who I was. And I remember having this identity crisis and I, and, um, I was, I felt like I was lacking in role models and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And then I encountered the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> well, I don't know why that's funny. I don't know why you're laughing. It's very serious. I was really into the pumpkins at one time and, um, and the Smashing Pumpkins, they're, um, they're kind of a grunge band and, uh, led by, uh, third along Billy Corgan. And uh, I guess what I loved about the pumpkins is that they could vary from like really heavy rock, like kind of metal inspired rock, grunge, psychedelic, but they could also do like really soft uh, um, introverted lullabies and, and hymns. Um, and I loved that, that, that variance in it. Um, um, I encountered them at a time that they were kind of in the down low, like um, they, they did this quiet acoustic album called Adore, which was following on from like this massive album called Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. And I thought it was interesting watching them like, what do you do after, you, after you've conquered the world and made this gigantic double album? Um, you know, and, and on that tour, like their keyboardist overdosed and Billy had to fire his drummer who was his best friend and his mother died. And so, you know, that said something to me about, um, uh, about recovery, about, about when you've done, when everything has gone big and everything has gone wrong, you can kind of go smaller and more intimate. Um, Billy Corgan is kind of known as a bit of a tyrant. He... He has these visions for what he wants to express, the kind of songs that he wants to do and, and the way that people should perform. And at times he doesn't have much patience with his bandmates. He doesn't always share that. Um, and at various times he's fired and dismissed various parts of his band and, and re reconstituted the pumpkins with, with other people. Um, so at the time I, I was like, wow, cool. Like Billy just gets to run the show. Like Billy is an artist, like he knows what he wants and he doesn't let anybody stand in his way. Um, uh, as I went along, I, I, I started learning a lot from film directors um, and they're probably like the, the giants that have stayed with me the most, the giants that I think about the most. Um, um, film directors, especially the visual ones, visually inventive, uh, who work on really imaginative works, who use every tool in the box to, to tell grand stories. And when they've exhausted those tools, they invent new ones. They use technology, they invent new technology in order to augment their art. Sound familiar? 
Um, and probably the, the, the biggest one, the, uh, the you know, biggest inspiration for me is James Cameron. Um, so, you know, director of Aliens, Terminator, uh, Avatar, Titanic, uh, True Lies, The Abyss. Um, I, I, what I love about James Cameron is his efficiency. You know, I feel like, I feel like he hasn't made a bad movie. I think Avatar is a good movie. Um, I, I feel like um, every shot that, that he includes in his movies are full of story, are, are, are thoughtfully put together, are well composed, have a point. Um, I love that um, he's an artist, you know, he, he, he's a designer. I love that um, he can do these massive action set pieces, you know, some of the biggest um, most inventive action scenes ever, uh, and he's, but he can also do these very intimate moments like the hand on the glass in Titanic, um, um, or, you know, the, the death of, of um, the Terminator, or, um, or the relationship between Newt and, and, and Ripley in Aliens. Um, and Cameron was also known as, as a very demanding, very difficult person to work with. Um, Apparently he's chilled out a bit in recent years, but you know he was known for throwing hissy fits and for having very little patience for people that he didn't feel were on board and who didn't see his vision and who weren't working as hard as he was. Uh, one story that stuck with me was when um, the producers of Titanic tried to get it shut down. They were like, you're running behind schedule, you're running over budget, which all of his movies do. Um, and you know, you're building these gigantic sets and you're working with water and your actors are miserable and they were trying to shut it down. And he said, you know, if you're going to shut this movie down, you will have to kill me, like literally. And I was like, wow. I was like, here's a guy with a conviction. Here's a guy who knows what he wants and he won't let anybody st stand in his way. Um, another director I, I, feel I look up to is George Lucas. Um, George Lucas has directed three great movies. Um, THX 1138, American Graffiti, and Star Wars. He didn't direct Empire and, and Return of the Jedi. Um, and I admired George because he didn't just invent technology to fulfill his art, he created companies to invent the technology to fulfill his art, right? So he, he started Pixar, he started LucasArts, he started ILM, he started Skywalker Sound. Um, so this was an empire builder. Um, but George Lucas, I also think of as a cautionary tale, you know, um, at some point, you know, he, people stopped being able to say no to George Lucas. Um, the people around him were like, oh my God, you made Star Wars. And they kind of let him do what he wanted and his work suffered for it. He, you know, his later work, um, you know, in particular, the, the Star Wars prequels, um, which have their fans, but um, are, are, are just not as shining and not as polished and not as bold as, as the original films. And so I, I try to remember that. I try to remember that sometimes you can't have control over, over everything. Sometimes you need people around you to kind of call you out on your shit or, or your ludicrous visions. Um, Try and move along. Uh, another director I think about a lot, Ridley Scott. Um, I love that Ridley Scott did ads for like over a decade before his first masterpiece, right? So he spent a, he he did over two hundred uh, like TV ads um, in order to learn his craft, in order to learn cinematography, in order to learn how to work with actors, in order to work on on budget, on schedule. Um, Ridley Scott's very much a craftsman. You know, he loves just completing a production, kind of working on spec. Um, he's not as much of a dreamer. He, it feels like he's very craftsman-like with his work. And because of that, I feel like his work varies. Um, if he has a good script, he does tremendous work. Um, if his script is not good, he maybe doesn't challenge the, the writers enough. Um, uh, I love that Ridley is also an artist. He's, he, can, he storyboards himself, he communicates um, through, through his visuals. Um, of course, I've been really inspired by the work of Pixar. Um, Pixar also started out uh, doing ads. They, they sustained themselves by doing ads uh, for a long time. 
before they got to do kind of their 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 dream, which is to do a feature film. Um, for a good span of time, they made this series of perfect films, and they kind of reinvented uh, animated feature feature films along the way, and and told these stories that couldn't have been told before if it weren't for technology. Right? They were all they were simultaneously pushing technology and pushing what an animated film could be. Um, so I've always been really inspired by sort of the arc of Pixar and how that came together and how they foster talent and how they challenge themselves. Um, so after um, Alice Maddish Returns, after I'd, I felt like I'd, you know, I'd learnt a bunch from artists and, and, and learnt uh, how to be an art director, I, I wanted to to try my hand at game design. I wanted to learn, uh, to, to, I've always felt like, you know, I've always loved video games. I thought that I could make one myself. Um, and around this time, around 2010, 2011, um, mobile games were becoming a thing. And what I loved about mobile games was they reminded me of the, the NES games that I grew up with, right? Simple games, um, uh, games that were all about just an interesting mechanic and some some cool art, and it, they didn't have to be these epic things that required fifty to hundred people or more. Um, um, and around also at the same time, this this tool called Unity 3D was introduced to me, and Unity felt like it did a lot of the the boring work for me, and it required coding, but not too much. Like I could code badly, like I do. And um, and this, and I also encountered you know Tiny Wings and Tiny Wings was made by a guy called Andreas Eliger in seven months and uh, at the time I remember reading it it sold uh, over three million units and I was like wow that's pretty cool I you know maybe I could do that maybe I could do something like that and that would be a way of getting into to game design kind of without anybody standing in my way. Um, so I was inspired by Tiny Wings. Um, I was inspired by an article I read um, about uh, success on the App Store. You, you can Google the, the title down there, Money on the App Store, uh, written by um, Emeric uh, Thoa, Thoa uh, of the Game Bakers. And he did this analysis of all these various successes on the App Store. Um, you know, games that were free to play, games that were paid, how well they did. And kind of the last example that he mentions is, is uh, Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery EP. And I love that he wrote that they broke all the rules. You know, they, they did all these things that were kind of counterintuitive. And yet they, they were really successful. Um, that sounded really plucky. And I'm like, I, I kind of want to do that. I kind of want to break the rules. Um, Another mobile game that I found really inspiring at this time was Spell Tower by Zach Gage. Um, I remember reading that Spell Tower made more money for Zach Gage in, in two weeks than he had earned in the previous two years. Um, he is an artist, so. Uh, but, but I also love that um, Zach Gage doesn't like word games. You know, Zach Gage thought, I'm going to make a word game for people that don't like word games. And he made this and it's tremendously fun and I, I love it. Um, and of course, you know, I couldn't be studying mobile games and, and touch devices without learning a little bit about Apple and Steve Jobs. Um, uh, a lot has been written and said about Steve Jobs. Um, I think what's interesting about him and what is maybe relevant today is that he's a disruptor. Uh, he challenged people's notions about what computers could be and what digital devices could be and what technology could be. And he brought his sensibilities, his personality to the table, right? He was a hippie, he was a college dropout. He didn't go to the classes he was supposed to, but he went to uh, typography classes instead. And because of who he was, that you know, that, that improved computing, that improved, uh, the, he, he challenged the status quo. And I think that that's something that we should all be doing. We should all be taking the experiences that we have, everything that makes us who we are, 
and and saying you know what if games could be like that what if there were games for these kinds of peoples or or that enshrined these values um so like james cameron uh like billy corgan uh, steve jobs is known as someone who's not not the greatest to work for he can be very demanding again he's a visionary but um, doesn't have a lot of patience for people that uh, that he feels don't get it. Um, so um, after my adventure making a game by myself, uh, I joined a studio in, in London called Us2, and we got to make this game called Monument Valley, uh, which uh, did pretty well. And um, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, you just made a game out of Escher, right? Like shouldn't like I th think the Escher estate actually wanted to sue us um, but uh, pe people think oh you must they, they say to us you must have just like looked at Escher art a lot you must have just studied the crap out of that right and it's like uh, I mean not really um, I was most inspired by this one image ascending and descending um, but I didn't, I didn't look that much. I didn't study Escher that closely because by this time I was so used to accumulating tons of references and tons of inspirations. Um, people also thought that we ripped off Echochrome, uh, which was a PSP game, uh, also about impossible geometry, uh, non-Euclidean geometry. Um, or they'd say that we ripped off Fez and I'm like, well, which is it? Did we rip off Fez? Did we rip off Echochrome? Um, the truth is that the, um, the three games that Monument Valley borrowed most from were Portal. Uh, from Portal, I, I, I felt like I learned um, how to weave together puzzles with storytelling, right? So like, um, so having these discrete puzzle chambers, right? Not, not hiding the fact that this is a game, that, it is, that they are levels, just letting them be, be, be these, these puzzle levels and then using subtle sound and visuals to, to tell the story. Um, we took a lot of inspiration from Windowsill by Vector Park. Um, this, was, this is one of those games that people say, oh, it's not really a game. Um, uh, Vector Park is a flash animator and he's incredible at it. He, he just loves surprising, delightful, weird animations. And a lot, of, a lot of them don't have any point. You just kind of tap on things and they do weird things, but that's okay. It's okay because it's an interactive experience. And again, it's in the series of vignettes. It's a series of levels and it doesn't hide the fact that every time all you're just trying to do is open the door to get to the next level. Um, and so for this, I, you know, we leaned very heavily on this and thought, oh, what if, what if it was just a series of puzzles and that's okay. It doesn't have to, you don't have to like, level up and upgrade and have difficulty. And of course, uh, Sword and Sorcery. The fact that these guys made it on the App Store, that they were premium priced, that they were, it was a slower experience, that it wasn't really addictive, that they, were tr they, they combined like interesting art and sound and writing was really inspirational uh, to us. And of course, you know, we looked, uh, we, we drew so much from architecture around the world um, um, architecture from North Africa and the Islamic world and India and Russia. And, um, you know, <laughs> when, when the game came out, people would tweet at us and say like, oh, look, it's like Monument Valley in real life. And I'm like, no, that's kind of, that's real life. And we kind of stole from that. Um, so, uh, you know, this is where my, my interest in architecture, my layman's interest in architecture, I, I, I was able to bring that uh, into the game. And, you know, we, had, we looked at everything. We looked at um, architectural models. We looked at, at graphic design. We looked at sculptures um, for inspiration uh, as to what Monument Valley could be. Um, so that was in 2014. And, and um, uh, this year, I, I left us too, and I started my own company uh, called Mountains. And I knew that if I was going to be the boss and the director of this company that I needed to uh, become a better person. I need to become a better manager, a better collaborator. I needed to uh, 
uh, become better than some of the idols that I've talked about, than Billy Corgan and Steve Jobs and James Cameron. I didn't want to be known for being difficult to work with, which I am. And I, I still am kind of difficult to work with and for, but I, I, I want to do better. I don't, I don't want those victories if it means those losses. I don't want to have to piss people off in order to make art. Um, so I needed to look beyond sort of the giants that I that I'd collected and that I that I that I'd idolized for for a long time. Uh, someone that I've thought about for a while is Steven Soderbergh, and I I admire Steven Soderbergh because he goes between very commercial, huge, big budget projects to very small, intimate, personal projects, um, and he kind of uses one to fund the other. And uh, I read this interview once with Soderbergh where he talked about being on set and being the director. And when there's a problem, it's so important that he doesn't lose his temper and he doesn't lose his cool. Because when the shit hits the fan, people look to him. And if he's the one panicking and blaming people and being upset, then people will lose respect for him because they're like, he's not in charge, he's not in control. He said it's really important for him to just focus on the problem and get it solved. Um, so that's something that I, I try to remember and, I, I, and I, you know, I want to be that kind of director. I think about uh, my time at, at Spicy Horse where we made um, Alice. I, I think about my boss, American McGee. And uh, something that not a lot of people know about American is that he's actually a really generous, really empathetic, uh, funny person to work for. Um, you know, he, he gave me my first job um, he put up with all my shit for a long time and he would always sit me down and kind of explain issues to me, explain why this person is upset and, and why I'm not communicating clearly. And he would always make sure that people had what they needed to do to, make, to do their best work. He would give people time off and he would, you know, have company holidays and company barbecues. And I try to remember that generosity and, and that, that giving and that, that sense of collaboration. Uh, now that I have my own studio. Um, I think about Rami Ismail. I think about how um, he is a co-founder of a company, but he's also a developer of free tools for other, indie, for other indies like us uh, because he wants to give. He wants to give back. He wants to, to democratize game development. And he spends his time and, and money touring the world, like visiting... Uh, not just Australia, but but um, places like South Africa, people places like uh, all around Europe and America and uh, and Asia and 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 f f collecting stories and speaking and and being in touch with you know the worldwide indie scene to encourage diversity, to encourage understanding, to to work with um, the up and coming people. Um, and he's such a he's such a kind, generous soul. He's so giving, um, all the time. And uh, again, I, I you know now now that I've made games and now that I um, have had some success with that, I, I try to think more about not just the product, not just the the games product that we're making, but also the community around me and and how to give back to them and, and support them. So the topic of uh, what makes a giant. Um, preparing for this talk really made me think about the relationship between creators and uh, the creators who have come before them. And I think that um, the answer that I really arrived at was that we're the, one who make, we're the ones who make giants. Uh, we, we build them up, we invent them, we, we put people on pedestals and we um, make a big deal out of them and we mythologize them. Uh, because sometimes we need heroes, we need symbols who can be bigger than any one person, right? People that can, these giant figures who can accomplish the impossible and seem to have infinite stamina and, and the will to fight against the odds, and they feel superhuman. Um, but the truth is that they're, they're only human, they're just, they're people, they're us, they are our peers. And that's something that I feel like I should have remembered from my days on the forum, you know, being amongst, you know, professionals and students 
um, alike. And, you know, we were all, we we're all the same. We we're all just forum members. So in a way, there are no giants. I feel like we're all dwarves. Um, and certainly we're dwarves. But if we can see further, maybe it's because we're standing on the shoulders of other dwarves and they're standing on other dwarves. So it's more like a stack of dwarves. Except the thing is you can like, you can stand on more than one person, right? So it's kind of like a pyramid of dwarves. So if I've seen further, <laughs> it's because I found a nice pyramid of dwarves to stand on. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for questions. Where'd my student helper go? Oh. Outside, got Okay, door. okay. I've got head volunteer here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, when was the talk put together? Does, did it seem odd that other, that, um, that you're probably now seen as, seen as a giant yourself in the industry? So the question is, when I was putting the talk together, did it seem odd that I'm maybe now seen as a giant myself? Well, I didn't want to focus on that. You know, <laughs> this talk is already so much about me. And, um, you know, I, I guess, um, again, I felt like I ended up in a place where I think maybe I always knew that, like, I'm, I am, I, I have had, I've accomplished some things, but I'm also just the same as you guys. I feel like I'm a student. I feel like the things that I've accomplished are, um, no greater or no less than anybody else in this room. Like we all have <coughs> battles and sometimes we get lucky and it, we get commercial success. And, and the thing that you realize is that maybe you didn't do anything more special that time. Like, like every game that I've worked on has been a slog, has been a battle. And, it, and I've just felt good just to complete it, you know? Whether the game was like Bad Day LA and it sold no units and it got 28 on Metacritic, or it was Monument Valley that sold, you know, 27 million units and won all these awards. Like completing that production, that was that felt to me the reward in itself. So, um, so I didn't, I didn't want to, I never wanted to focus too much on just commercial success or just fame, because that's. I have so many friends that have been burned by that. You know, they found commercial success and fame. And if they bought too much into it, it kind of backfired and they ended up really empty and depressed because actually nothing changes, you know? Um, at the end of the day, you have to go home and, um, and you know, what are you gonna do after, after the award ceremony or after the millions of dollars that I don't have? Um, so um, I didn't wanna talk as if I was a giant. I, I really wanted to focus on um, these other people who were actually way more famous and more successful than me, and and but and then maybe actually understand that they are humans too. Yeah. Yeah. These guys are amazing, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes. Did you personally consider Hacky Cat a success? I did. Yes, because I set my goals at the start of the project, which was that I wanted to uh, learn about other aspects of game development that I hadn't done before. So I'd done art and art direction, but I hadn't actually animated before. Um, I hadn't done programming uh, like to that extent. I hadn't uh, run it as a business. Like I hadn't done sort of the production side, scheduling, like having a Twitter account, uh, working with a PR agency. I wanted to understand those things so that the next time I can, I can say to a programmer, yeah, that is really hard. I can see why that would take a long time or, or you know, understand that. And so that was um, one of the goals. And the other was to just kind of make enough to kind of cover my year of expenses or however long it took. It took 13 months to make. And um, by the time I was done, it made, I think, roughly $35,000 US, I think, uh, which was kind of enough to cover a year um, and I was living at home with my parents at the time and that knowledge of making a mobile game that greatly informed my next job uh, working at us two you know I kind of got 
partially got the job because I'd been able to do that. And, you know, when I was there, I could say like, I know you've hired me just as an artist, but you know, I've, I've made a mobile game. I, I, I get the app store. I've read this article. <laughs> so I, I do consider Hacky Cat a success. And I kind of wish people wouldn't keep asking me to make Hacky Cat 2. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yes? When you started Art Direction, do you ever miss being more hands-on? Um, I never really stopped being hands-on. Um, maybe that's a problem because when people wouldn't do the art that I wanted, I'd be like, I'll just let me do it. Um, you know, like a great example is, and I'm talking about a failure here, and I've, I've failed a lot as an art director in order to, to be an okay one. Um, I, didn't, I never understood lighting very well. Like I'd never done lighting. I never studied it like 3D, like stage lighting. And the artists who were working with me on, on Alice, they would always light the scenes not very well, but I didn't know how to express to them what I wanted or, or, what, or what was good, you know, what was maybe, and I didn't, I didn't have that, that education. And so we got to like three months before the end of the project and you know, a lot of the scenes, just, they, they weren't showing the best of what the 3D models were there and, and you know, it was hard to read the scenes. And my creative director said to me, um, I want you to light the scenes. Um, and I'm like, whoa, okay. And I actually had to ask my artists, my lighting artists, like how do I, how do I what's a light? What's, how do I, you know, what is this light? What does this light do? Um, and I was able to, to place lights kind of based on my instincts, like things that I'd learned from seeing movies and watching and reading comics. And like, I'm like, oh, I think there's a, I think rim lights are a thing. I should probably put a rim light here. And I, I vaguely know what three point lighting is. Um, and I, but I was able to figure it out really fast and, and be hands on. And I love doing that, but it's not something that I really should have had to do. Like I should have delegated. If I was a good art director, I should have, had the knowledge or been able to find the knowledge to show the, to show my artists, to, 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 to help them do their best work instead of replacing their work. Uh, and of course, now that I'm at a studio of four people, uh, I get to be very hands-on uh, from code to shaders, to 3D modeling, um, to running the Twitter account. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're talking about um, taking skills from other mediums and applying them to art, for example. Have you noticed things the other way around? Like, have you noticed doing programming, taking skills from art? Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like I've been very fortunate to work with many multidisciplined people along the way. So, the uh, technical director on Monument Valley, um, like me, he'd made a game by himself, and so he can do um, he can do art. It's not tremendous, but it's it's better than your usual programmer art. And through that, he's done lighting, he's done shaders, he's done animation. Um, and he's a very well-rounded individual. He's into hiking and he's into um, science fiction. And so we would have these great back and forths where, you know, um, as a as a as a creative artistic person, I understand a bit of engineering, and as an engineer, he understands a bit of um, of art and aesthetics. And so we could kind of understand each other and have great arguments, but also um, collaborate. And it's, it's, it's true now as well. Like the people that I've, I've pulled around me um, are also multidisciplined. Uh, Camino over there is a great community manager and, and volunteer and, and um, has run a Kickstarter, survived a Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And my lead programmer, Tony, uh, actually did an animation degree. And my other programmer, Sam, um, has a great interest in sort of philosophy and art. And, um, and so um, I think I, I really enjoy working with multidisciplined people. Specialists are good too. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, Reinforce your answer from a programmer's perspective. Yes. Um, you do need to be able to build the bridge in both directions. So as a coder, I've been given a piece of art that you then put it into the engine and stupid things happen to it because now it has a bunch of technology. Right. And so you then need to you need to be able to run the conversation from the programmer to the artist as well, uh, which I am struggling with to <laughs> say, you know, no, you can't do the art that way because 
Yeah, one, one of the good pieces of advice that I was given early on was if you find a good technical artist, hire them and keep them and keep them happy because um, they, are the, they, they can be a bridge, you know? Technical artists can speak code and they can speak art and they, they know how to fuse them together. And, you know, like I was talking about from your Ridley Scott to your James Cameron to even Steve Jobs, they're able to, to see both sides and try to pull people together and, and work together. And that's what games are, right? Games is, is where technology and art meet. So, so yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, oh, one more. Sorry. Kind of like, um, like uh, Steve Jobs and like really sort of those kinds of, those giants of the film realm and stuff like that. How much of your design would you consider to be like instinctual? Um, a lot. A lot of those instincts are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so again, like think about George Lucas where he gets himself into a position where people don't say, can't say no to him, or maybe he doesn't listen, and his worst instincts come out, you know? Um, and so I, I'm often second guessing myself. I'm often like, I, I, we could do this, but maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe we should do something else. That thing that I, I decided, maybe we should not do that. And uh, maybe to a fault, you know? Like it, it was interesting, um, Corey's talk just then, talking about vision. Uh, maybe I need to swing back a bit in the other direction and, and, and make my visions more concrete again. Um, but yeah, I think we all have instincts and maybe, maybe what's important is to be able to support those instincts with examples and with data or, and, and kind of contain those, those experiments, right? You don't want to um, have a, a project just hinge on one person's instincts because it could work out, but it could collapse horribly. Um, and I am now in the position where I want to run a sustainable business. I want to pay employees. I want to survive this game so I can make the next game. So it's not good enough for me to just base it on a whim. Um, I want to do my research and I want to, um, to draw from all the research I can so that my instincts have some, some, some backup to them. Cool. Well, I'm going to be around all, all of Melbourne Games Week. So if you have anything else to ask me, I'll be around. And yeah, good luck. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>